what are the risks at this moment? Because from India's perspective, it could possibly be a huge opportunity. To what extent have you been able to capitalize on the opportunity of the government through its uh, production-linked incentives, through its Make in India scheme, Atmanirbhar India, trying to pull away from China as part of anybody who's looking to reorient their supply chains uh, in keeping with China plus one. To what extent is India benefiting? That's from an Indian point of view. And what are the risks that you're observing from a more macro level? Yeah. No, in terms of the... You know, as the, in terms of the signaling, in terms of intent, when you talk to people and when you look at projects being announced, there is certainly a big interest in India right now, especially to, you know, to, in terms of the new policy of diversifying away from, you know, for instance, from China. But if you look at the last two decades of, uh, of manufacturing in India, the share of manufacturing GDP hasn't changed much. It's been around 17 to 18 percent over the last couple of decades, right? So, you know, clearly a greater push is needed in terms of uh, attracting all that investment in and in terms of making sure that uh, manufacturing has a higher share in production and making India is a, is a bigger success. You know, more, more will be needed. You spoke of risks because the IMF's task, you said, is also to highlight risks as this uh, uh, untangling happens. What are the risks that concern you the most? One is on inflation in the major economies. The good news is that it has been coming down. There have been hopeful signs, but we're not there yet. And we could still have a situation where inflation, yes, has come down, but doesn't go close enough to the targets of central banks, in which case they will need to raise interest rates by a lot more. And then we all and I to have the kind of soft landing that everybody's projecting at that time, and that could be a real shock to the global economy. Second is the war is not over. Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues. You could see big impacts on energy prices again, on food prices. That remains an important risk. China is a, is a concern. Uh, I think the downside risks to China's growth are, uh, have gone up. And we're seeing a lot of cli climate-related events, weather events around the world that's disrupting growth and affecting prices. Okay, so let's take it one by one because one of the things that was discussed in India's G20 is not linked directly to the G20, but President Biden, uh, MBS from Saudi Arabia, uh, spoke of an India Mideast Europe corridor, and the IMF is one of the bodies that will be involved in arranging financing for that. How do you see this infrastructure corridor play out? Yeah. So firstly, we don't get involved. The IMF doesn't get involved in infrastructure projects. I just projects. Emmanuel Macron's... Uh, uh, press conference where he was speaking about working with the IMF and the World Bank in the project, yeah. Yeah, so on project financing, it's squarely the World Bank. Of course, we are get involved whenever there is a macro issue to deal with. Uh, this is a fresh announcement. There is, I know that there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for it, but I think it's too early to comment on the details of it. Okay. The other thing that's raising a lot of headlines is the idea that India will soon be the world's third largest economy. How soon do you see that happen? Uh, that it will happen sometime in the next few years seems inevitable. Uh, 2027 is one estimate, which, which is the SPI's estimate, seems the most aggressive estimate. Others say it could happen 2028, 2029. What's your reading at this moment? Yeah, I think what you said that, yes, in a few years, not too long, in a few years, in the ballpark of the years you're talking about, based on current projections. What uh, are your current projections for That this? would be, so if you looked at our, the last estimates we put out in July for India's growth, then you'd get around there to 2027, 28. I think that's when you would get to the third largest. But I think uh, you know, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And the more important thing is to maintain a high growth momentum for many more years than just the next four or five years. And that So you think it could happen reforms. by 2027? Based on, uh, in terms of the dollar, yes, in current value, in current dollar terms, you could, based on projections, it could get there by 27, 28. I think that's but based on that But you're also saying fiscal. that to keep the growth momentum going, you'd yes. like to see a lot more. Yes, what I mean, more? again, it's, you know, India is a large country. So in per capita terms, that will still be a small number, even if you're overall the third largest economy. So India needs to keep pushing on that front to keep the growth momentum going much more. We interviewed someone you know well, Borge Brande, the president of the World Economic F uh, Forum, and uh, at the India 800 Summit, he spoke of the next 10 years, seeing the Indian economy hit 
the, uh, a 10 trillion dollar value and he said that the global economic order would be defined by what he called the G3, uh, the US, China and India. I'm kind of wondering what you think of that. Okay, firstly, I'm not a huge fan of these projections of 10 trillion dollars and so on. Uh, as we know, over the last three years, a lot can happen. We had the pandemic, we had the war, sure. things can get derailed, a lot of things can go wrong. You know, so setting aside those you know, big headline numbers, I think the important thing is that China, sorry, India is a very important player on the global stage. Clearly through the G20, it signaled a serious leadership role. Even in terms of the, the world growth, like I said, it's contributing like 15% of to world GDP growth. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. It has a, a young demographic population, which is again a big asset, but you need to be able to catalyze that through structural reforms. And how has this G20 been for you? Because on the finance track, there's been so much that's been happening. You spoke of uh, you know, India signaling global leadership. So what are the signals that you've been picking up and how's this year been for you? Well, I think it's been a great year for India's G20 presidency. You know, nobody expected that there would be a leader's declaration. The fact that there was one, um, I think is a, huge, is a huge deal. It tells you that even though we can all be, you know, countries can have a different opinions about the way the world is headed, they can actually come together and have a declaration. That's, that I think is huge. The second thing I think they did really well was to you know, bring, uh, put, put a lot of light on the issues that emerging and developing countries care for. So bringing the African Union in as a member of the G20 on a permanent basis is another big, uh, big step in that direction. And all of the work that's been done on the crypto regulation, on debt and debt issues and multilater multilateral development banks financing, I mean, all of that are all part of how you know, the, the Prime Minister refers to as we need to help the Global South. Do you want to uh, share some light on how you think global indebtedness for those countries that are heavily indebted uh, is being dealt with and what more would you like to see? You know, after a long time, I think we're beginning to see progress on that front. For me, the debt relief and the debt restructuring that was done for Zambia is quite a landmark. Mm -hmm. We had creditors of all different, you know, the Paris Club, non-Paris Club, private creditors all come together to agree on a set of re on restructuring for Zambia. I think that's a big deal. India, along with uh, the IMF and the World Bank, were part of the, put, put out the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable. That has played a very important role and also in trying to engage and trying to fix problems in the global debt architecture. So I think we've made progress, but a whole lot more is still needed and we need to do, make these restructurings happen at a much faster pace. You know, outside of all global macroeconomic questions, you may have seen that one video of uh, the IMF boss, Kristalina Georgieva, she's doing a sumbly dance number and I'm wondering when you're seeing that video, what's going through your head? And she came, she's been smashing the internet. Yes. Uh, and earlier you were the one IMF uh, nominee that most people know. She's not there yet, but she's getting <laughs> a couple of more dance moves and then she's going to smash the internet some more. Now this, that's typically Kristalina. That is her. She loves to dance. So, uh, you know, you, other, when she sees other people dancing and she sees good music, hears good music, uh, she wants to she get She was in. the only one who got into the groove, okay? She was like totally having fun and joining in. Most of the others saw Dur Dur Se, but she, she went in and yeah. you know, really was part of the cultural emotion. Absolutely. No, that's her. That's just total her. You're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's been talk of millets uh, and pushing millets linked to climate security, linked to using less... Um, uh, you know, using less water, but then there's also just overdose of millets, right? Uh, you were at the state bank, where how was it? You l you loved your millets or not so much? Yeah, that was a lot of millets. It was it was very it was very good. It was delicious. You're being diplomatic. <laughs> no, I enjoyed it. it. But yes, there were a lot of millets in the <laughs> yeah. in the menu. Okay, great.